Welcome to the Rookie Scale Remote Film Room. I'm your host, John Chapkevich. Joining me today is Big East Player of the Year, Sandro Mamukelishvili. What's going on, Sandro? Hey, how you, do how you doing? Thanks for the invite. Uh, I really appreciate it. Yeah, of course, man. I'm doing great. I'm, uh, you know, excited to, you know, have gotten through the college basketball season. I know there was a lot of worry with COVID and how everything would go, but there certainly were some hitches along the way, but it was good to see March Madness back in full swing and get through the season. And now, you know, we're entering the early stages of pre-draft. So excited for all of that to come here shortly. Uh, how about you? What's going on with you? Same here, you know, uh, tough season. At first, you didn't know if it would happen. So first of all, I'm blessed to have a season. I feel like like for us, Big East uh, Conference did a great job just kind of putting all together and keeping us safe. First and foremost, our, our trainers and stuff. So definitely got to give them credit. But right now, I'm just working towards the draft. And, you know, I'm really excited of what, what lays ahead. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I think I can speak for kind of the whole you know, prospect scouting community in that, you know, last year your name was kind of starting to get a little bit of buzz, but not like full tilt draft buzz. I remember seeing your name on that uh, list of 105 top prospects that the like NBA front offices voted on. And I think some people were like, oh, Sandra Memo Kelish Philly, like, like not really expecting it. But, you know, when you <laughs> would dig into your tape last year, there were so many exciting flashes as to what you, you could you. do at your size and with your ball skills and stuff. So we'll get into some more of that from some clips from this season, but like, how did you, I guess, you know, get so comfortable like as a passer and handler and all that sort of stuff. And like, maybe you want to give a little bit of your story of your early basketball life and ending up at Montford and you know, what your ultimate sort of path was to get to where you are today. So uh, I'm from a little, little country of Georgia, a little small Eastern European town, um, not town country. So, um, you know, it, it was it was a tough journey um, kind of growing up. You don't see a lot of Georgian players um, right. make it make it out. And it was definitely uh, like tough just growing up. Your parents always tell you to kind of go to school and do your homework and not to focus on basketball that much because, you know, as a parent, they don't know how much how far basketball can take you, you know, so you got to right. understand. Too. But I feel like I always had this passion and desire for basketball and the love of, of the game where. I always told myself I can I can make it out and I can go some places. So, uh, you know, definitely kind of started playing seriously around 10, 11, uh, when I was around 10, 11. Um, Were you already pretty tall at that point in time? I was pretty tall, not not very tall, but I, I was I was pretty tall. I was I was the tallest in my class, and yeah, you know, um, I feel like I started taking it more serious, kind of get, getting extra work work in. So. Um, like it slowly just escalated it. And then I was called in uh, youth national team with the Georgian basketball. So, you know, mm -hmm. that was I feel like the biggest kind of like a step in my career where my father right. was like, okay, he's pretty nice. A lot of Georgian coaches like him. So maybe we should take it further. And then uh, I went out, I played with Georgian national team in Greece and in, uh, in uh, Turkey. And I got a couple of offers from Italian teams. Um, and the Palacanestro Biela is like one of the teams in, the, mm -hmm. in Italy um, was amazing. You know, I went down, visited it, and I fell in love with it. The development of the players and the coaches and everything, like there was just kind of like a big family kind of reunited. And, you know, at, at first, definitely, it, it was it was tough. I didn't know Italian, so had no friends. I was in there just sitting. Like I, I went to school and everything was in Italian. So definitely I feel like, mental, like mentally it got me stronger where – I had yeah. to learn Italian fast and mentally you struggle. So I feel like I was breaking down, but my family was there like holding me up and just pushing me through it. And once I learned Italian, I loved it. You know, just uh, I feel like once you learn Italian culture, it's like the different different atmosphere. As a, as a tourist, you don't understand as much. But when you live there and you see how they live, it's just amazing people. So definitely had uh, probably best best two years out there just just played played basketball and slowly got a recognition. Uh, there was this European rankings at that point, and I was yeah. in there, and, and it was just kind of like just everything was kind of put going into places. And then uh, kind of I knew assistant coach at Montverde Academy, and my mm -hmm. dream was, was to play college hoop. So um, we kind of made it happen. I came over here, played at Montverde, and then went to Senior Hall. So journey was definitely long, but. I feel like you're worth it and everything is just kind of 
happens for a reason. So I'm really excited and blessed to just have this this um, tough road because I feel like mentally it really prepared me for the next level. Absolutely, man. That's that's an awesome story. Do you, how's your Italian now? You still got uh, you still fluent, got it in yeah. the back? Uh, yeah, right. yeah, it's fluent. Um, it took me so 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 much to kind of learn it. Now it's nothing gonna like I would never kind of like not remember it. You know, like yeah. I just know it just because like. Whew, I wish you saw me in class. It, it, yeah. it was it was a show. So definitely, like I'm always remember Italian. Yeah, that that's cool, man. That's cool, and I think there's you know exactly what you were saying. There's de definitely something to be said for you know having gone through that sort of story and being able to adapt on the fly and kind of adjust to different environments, different you know different settings as you make this transition from Seton Hall to the NBA, you know, having that sort of mental makeup and being able to adapt on the fly will be huge for your transition to the next level for sure. Definitely, definitely. Like Italian, Italy was one story, but then yeah. Mount Verde was a different story, you know? So, right. I, and Georgia was different. So I, I feel like you're right, like adjustment, adjustment wise, like it was really kind of hard, but I feel like I just got used to it. So slowly it became like easier and easier and mentally it became easier. So definitely, definitely helped me a lot. Yeah. That's great, man. So uh, now that we've got a little bit of background on you, for those that weren't familiar, what do you say we dive into your tape here, kind of dissect your game together, maybe uh, talk some strengths, some sure. potential improvement areas. Uh, maybe we'll, we'll just start with the offensive side of the ball here. Okay. So I think kind of what's most exciting about you, from my perspective in scouting uh, you the past couple of years here, is just how dynamic you are at your size with the ball in your hands and your ability to make plays for yourself and others. So we'll watch this first clip through, but we'll start it back up at the top and maybe let you kind of break down what you're seeing here. So like, firstly, when you pop out here, uh, there's a little bit of a defensive miscommunication. Mm -hmm. So when you catch this here, kind of what's going through your mind, what are you looking for here as you're breaking this down? So uh, to be honest, first I wanted to shoot but then I yeah. just saw Nate Watson kind of leaning towards me. So mm -hmm. I feel like I could have ca I could have catch him. So I just pumped it, pump faked it and drove it. But he, he kind of like the other man stepped up, which I was not right. expecting. And then I drove into him. But I knew Nate Watson stepped up. Tyrese will be open. So I just this did um, like under low and Tyrese got a bucket. Right. So as you're, you know, firstly, the pump fake is beautiful. Like it's actually you're really selling it. And the fact that you have that in your bag to be able to step out and hit that, I think, you know, goes a long way and you being able to use that to your playmaking advantage thereafter. But, you know, once you get into here, this is kind of underrated as well. This little like hop step like to hop split step, yeah. these two uh, guys. Yeah. I mean, that's, I a, that's on, a great move. I worked on that hop step a lot. I feel like in the practices, a lot of times I was getting in charge. So in my mind, every time I drove in, I knew the, big fella would step up so I had to do the hop step and just kind of come down and then make a move you know what I'm saying so so I don't get a uh, offensive foul and on the pop right. you know every time I pop I look to shoot there is no other thought process than to shoot and I feel like just pump fake just came naturally where uh, yeah. I was I was waiting for Nate but the other guy came but it, it was just so natural it just happened by itself yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, once you kind of get into that elbow area or to the nail, it seems like you're a pretty good decision maker. So here you made the right read pro hop and kind of right. pass it off to this guy down low. But, uh, you know, I think we'll see in some other clips that you do a great job of reading kind of this backline guy. So here mm -hmm. he happens to stay too far out and you hit the right guy. But right. I think you also, you know, have that quick decision making to if this guy crashed down, kick it out to the corner here. To the exactly shooter, right. right. Like here, I see that he's on the outside of Tyrese. So mm -hmm. I knew if Tyrese would tuck the duck in, he would definitely get the ball. But, you know, at, at this point, when you do the hop step, you already see where he's at. So if he yeah. goes hard, like if he goes in front of Tyrese, then you got a hook pass to um, Miles Kelly in the corner. So definitely worked yep. out right there. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll see here. I mean, this is some pretty ridiculous handle for a big man and then a nice, nice flush to finish it. But, you know, like you're even – you're calling for this pick and roll – I guess, you know, what What are you seeing here with how this guy's defending you from point of attack to kind of decide to cross him over and reject the screen here? So um, I feel like I, at that point, um, like, you see, he he's, he was already kind of going going to the screen. Yeah. And I kind of, like, kind of misplaced it. But you see, like, his leg was already 
like out of the screen. So I feel like yeah. if I crossed it, he would just stay because Ike is so big, he could not catch up to me. And then I just did a cross and, you know, dunked it. So I feel like it was just kind of his his right foot just going over the screen. I had a little, little second there to kind of uh, change my direction and just go downhill on a big man. Yeah, so exactly, that's, that's exactly. Exactly. And his hips are flipped the wrong way here. Exactly. You hit him with that cross. And then I think what – what maybe you know is hiding behind a little bit of these this action in these bodies here is you kind of end up bringing it back again with another right to left cross yeah. to keep it from this guy digging from the wing exactly. right there, right? Exactly. Yeah, and and his momentum is already there, so I feel like I feel like when you play, it just comes naturally. Like when you watch it right now, like I definitely can say it. I, I I did the crossover at the screen because of his legs, but then I feel like it just came into motion where I just crossed the bag because of the guy on, on the wing. Yeah, exactly. Also, and so you, yeah, also, you know, sorry to interrupt, like just growing up, I always played like point guard when I was in Italy. So I feel like yeah. I work on my handles a lot. I feel like I love bigs with the handles who can kind of yeah. do this, the stuff I'm doing. So I feel like it just helps me a lot just to kind of go through the motions and, and do do this kind of stuff because I, I, I work on it every day in practice. And Coach Willard, he just trusts me so much. It, it's unbelievable. Yeah, man. I mean, that's where the modern game is going. Like, I mean, you there's absolutely like spots in the league for guys that are more traditional, like rim runners, rim protectors, like those those kind of bigs that are singularly focused on, you know, paint oriented uh, value add stuff. Yeah. But like there are these I mean, the, the biggest case study is obviously Jokic. That's like the highest echelon of this type of like handler, passer, yeah. shooter type big I man. It. But I yeah, he's awesome, man. Like, is that someone that you kind of watch and try to like take some small elements of their game and try to work some of that into your own game? Definitely, definitely. Like, passing is is one of my favorite things to do, and definitely, if you watch NBA today, Nikola is the one to go to as a, as a big man. You know, you got to see him. Uh, but as well as Nikola, uh, you got to watch Luka Doncic, who's kind of mm -hmm. big for his size, who can handle the ball, come off the yeah. big roll and, and dime. So, I feel like those two are like. I just kind of like when I watch them, I try to learn from them as much as possible because like they're so good. But definitely Jokic is one of the guys you can watch and you can see his footwork. And, and like he I feel like he anticipates everything like one step. Yeah. He's always one step ahead when he knows the guy going to cut. And that's when he makes the pass. So it, it's kind of really helpful to watch him. Yeah, absolutely. And and we'll see another little like point guard, uh, point big man uh, instance from you here. So uh you know this back line here is just wide open and a lot of big men you know if they had the ball up here might be uncomfortable and maybe just go to look and set up a dribble handoff or get things sort of initiated however you guys were anticipating but you had like the quick decision making to realize what was going on here and hit him hit him for this back cut yeah. uh so obviously love to see that as well and then I think, you know, right here, this is some pretty interesting manipulation of the defense with your eyes and a ball fake. So do you want to maybe talk me through when you catch this on the wing here, kind of what you're reading and how you're, you know, getting the defense to move how you want them to, to hit the open shooter? Definitely. So first and foremost, you got to say Tyrese, he's ducking in really good and he yep. got a mismatch. So the guy got to help down, which just, which just like lives us three on two out, uh, up at the top. So yep. I feel like just I always kind of when you play zone, the first thing you always got to think is about ball fake, ball fake, ball fake. So yep. they can shoot. And I feel like this worked out perfectly where our ball fake to, to call and the man just came up and I saw Shavar uh, in the corner. So it, it just worked out perfectly like that ball fake. They just went for it. And then you just got to make the pass, you know, pass. You can't. You, it's a hard pass. But like, I feel like right now I had so much space. I just it, it was easy pass. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I mean. You know, you definitely see a lot more zone like this in college than you will in the NBA. But there's a lot of zone concepts that are that are kind of emerging more and more in the NBA now. And a lot of even just man principles with help and whatnot. Like, you know, this guy diving down right here to double like that could happen exactly. with a mismatch in the NBA. So, exactly. you know, this is totally something that you could see at the next level and your ability to kind of read and react and, you know, zip that across the whole way to the corner, I think is Tyrese definitely def something that could be valuable. Exactly. exactly. Tyrese definitely helped us play a lot just by ducking in and then just, yeah. you know, then it was all ball fake and then the pass. So it, it, was, definitely, yeah. it was definitely. Definitely. And uh, I mean, this one, this one's pretty fun. I think just more, <laughs> this one's highlighting your footwork this time. Right. So you're coming up to, 
you know, set a little ball screen action, but uh -huh. end up kind of just slipping it, uh, you know, in toward the elbow and nail area there, which I think, you know, in this particular instance results in you uh, taking a shot. But I think, you know, a way that you could definitely add value at the next level is these exact type of plays. And then when the defense commits to you, you know, That's finding good. shooters in the corner yeah. too. Like I've seen you hit so many of those passes as well. But, uh, you know, we're right here like you've kind of faked over toward the corner and then mm -hmm. have the dexterity and footwork to kind of get back into a nice look here. Uh, you want to maybe just break down for me, just starting from right here, what you're seeing and how you even initially decide to slip and then what you're doing thereafter. So as you see, um, like my defender is on my back. It's, he's behind my mm -hmm. back, not, not under me. So I already know yeah. he's, about a, he's about a hard hatchet. And yep. uh, as soon as they hard hatchet, I just slip down uh, in, a, in a kind of middle. And when I catch it, it's a it's a ball fake because you you see there is a, a corner man open. So I knew exactly if he didn't if he didn't go for a ball fake, I could pass to the corner guy and he would get the three. So yeah. I feel like in this instance, like this ball fake helps me a lot. And then it's just the spin, and I already know I'm one on one with the big guy. So I feel like that's just more like a hook finish, um, which you work on every day, and it's just kind of natural. So um, definitely, just kind of ball fake helped me a lot, and just kind of reading a reading a guy, I knew he would fake, and then. It's just and just like a little hook a hook shot. So yeah. I know just I feel like it's all, all comes to you naturally when you play. Yeah, and I think your ball fakes like we saw in that previous mm -hmm. play against the zone and then this one right here, your ball fakes on passes are some of the best in this uh in this draft class. Definitely. I really think so. so. <laughs> And so now we see you, uh, I mean, this is kind of interesting. We see you actually initiate a, initiating a pick and roll as the handler to start, which firstly is somewhat rare for a guy that's like 6'11", right? Uh, but, you know, then you don't force the issue and kind of reset and are then becoming the screener, right? So mm -hmm. you end up popping on this one. You want to maybe just talk me through, like, when you're coming to set this side pick and roll and you see an empty corner over here, you know, what's going through your mind? Like, are you already anticipating that you're going to kind of slip and pop th pop out to that empty corner? Or what are you, what are you looking for on this? Yeah, I, I feel like I, every time I see that empty empty corner, like, I already know it's a pop because yeah. I can just go one-on-one -on -one from there. I can just back him down from there. You know, there are so many uh, different stuff you can do from, from that, that, that place right there. Also, I know that the five men is guarding me right now because uh they switched so yeah. i you know like you know i'll be faster than the five men and so i was just kind of popping out to see where he's at but i feel like at that that moment i had a lot of room to shoot so i just shot it so definitely when i pop from uh in the corner i always look i always anticipate pop because i know there are so many stuff you can do from it yeah and like you know we'll, we'll see let me start this one over again uh you know as you start running all this you know, that empty corner is just leaving no one right. even remotely here to help on you. Exactly. Right. Like this guy even, probably should be further over, but. Exactly. You know, but the, even if he helps, then I got Jared in the corner or if Champagne steps right. up, you can throw it up to Ike. So that's why it's so, yep. so, you know, like you got so much variation you can do from here. It just, it just, it's like, it's just really good pick and roll right there. Pick and pop right there. Yeah, it's deadly, and you have to have a big man like yourself that's able to both shoot and attack closeouts and everything like that to be able to like really maximize it. And you know, we'll see another mm -hmm. another pretty clean pick and pop right here. Uh, this time, uh, you know, you kind of start it with a little post up set, kick it mm -hmm. back out, and again reinitiate. But you know, this one's pretty easy for you, I'm sure, just because there, there's no one nearby. But it, again, I just like that. You know, you didn't really force the issue down in the post right here and kind of knew that you had this in your back pocket. I feel like that's um, like I got to give credit to coaches right there because they pointed out that um, they always uh, hard hats. So yeah. I, I knew it like every screen they would hard hat. So I feel like it just worked out perfectly where just looking at the scouting report, you already know if you said this and we worked on it. We always work on our post offense. So I yeah. knew, like if I passed the Shavar, he would hedge hard and then I would have open open three. Yeah, and you step into it so smoothly and comfortably. Like, there's no wasted motion there, and that's a clean, confident look from three. Not one of my best games, but definitely. <laughs> <good>. <laughs> hey, those those happen, man. Those happen. Definitely, definitely. definitely. 
Uh, and then I think here we see you guys are running a little kind of double screen action mm-hmm. here at the at the top. Um, I guess when you're when you're the second screener on this sort of action, is it is this typically the first guys diving and you're popping? Is that the the kind of go to on, on this as well? You know, yeah, you you can you can mix it up. Uh, I feel like here you just got to read Tyrese. Uh, me and Tyrese, like Tyrese, is a really really good pick and pop shooter. So right here, I'm just reading Tyrese. If Tyrese dies, I pop. So definitely, we worked on that every day in practice. Um, just like kind of switching it up. Sometimes I will pop. Sometimes he will pop. So here, it just when I see him rolling, I just pop automatically. So um, I feel like as as you know, five minutes guarding me here. And that's why mm-hmm. it's, it's so much easier because they hatch hard and I, I got an open shot. Yeah. And so so it's typically it's on you as the second screener in this to kind of just do do sort of the exactly. opposite of whatever he had done. Gotcha. Exactly. exactly. Cool. And yeah, that one works out pretty nicely right here. Not another another smooth lefty three pointer. And I think that is the end of the offensive strength okay. section here. So, uh, you know, obviously that's a lot of your high end appeal for the NBA is what we just went through there, right? Offensive side of the ball being six eleven, uh, and being able to kind of pass, shoot, all that sort of stuff. So all that's definitely encouraging for the next level. Now we're gonna hit on a potential improvement area here on the offensive end. Right. And some of this might be like contextual from like the role that you're asked to play, right? So, you know, a lot of the offense is always funneling through you uh at seton hall right like you you your usage is pretty high in the role that you're asked to play here so sometimes you know in that type of role you might end up forcing up some difficult stuff from time to time which is okay but you know we're just going to touch on a few of these turnovers that maybe uh could have been a little bit avoidable so you're leading a bit of a if there are no improvements to be done then something's wrong so i definitely enjoy watching the stuff i can improve on so Cool. Yeah. So what do you think of this one here? You got a little bit of like a secondary break going on here. Uh, what do you think kind of like broke down on this play? And like, what do you think you maybe could have done better on this one where you kind of get just get caught up here in some in some traffic? Uh, first off, definitely the pace. I feel like I didn't like, you know, some when you run offense, you want to change speeds. And I feel like I should have just changed speed. And if I wanted to kind of fake the handle, fake the screen. Um, I should have changed the speed, went slower. But definitely what makes it harder is uh, Miles Kale uh, right here. You know, his man just digs in, and I just look yeah. at that with the side of the ball. So, you know, I feel like at this point, and the offense is just starting, I should just use Ike and just go into the secondary, kick it to Miles, and just kind of go with yeah. the ball. So I feel like it was just kind of like forced drive uh, there. Yeah, and like they played pretty good defense on this, and this this isn't all that different from you know earlier when you rejected the pick and roll. It just there was a little bit more congestion yeah, here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and this guy makes a good play on the dig, and exactly what you said, like to right here. Maybe maybe you know I see you're trying to get into that pro hop, but maybe if you're just able to kick that out to Miles in the corner, either he right. has an open look right here from this dig, right. or you just get like reset and you, you maybe also, you go set up a post up afterwards, right? I feel like I didn't read Ike's man really correctly because he just kind of like sagged off, so he was yeah. like, he was sagging off. So when I drove it, like he was right there to step up, and he didn't really come up to kind of read the pick and roll. So I feel like it was just kind of misread there too right yeah. right yeah and like the, you know this guy's in a decent position over here to cover both of these so it's not like mm-hmm. firing a skip was really going to be available to you so you know again they play pretty good d but just you know trying to cut out some of those uh from the equation could be helpful i think you ended up hustling and getting the, getting the position mm-hmm. back there though to your credit too so that's good yeah. to see um the next piece here is just kind of like you know, you run this pick and roll and you're, you're in a decent spot right now, right? Like you, this guy is kind of off balance, get, gets clipped on the screen right here. And you know, that they, they again have some pretty decent help defense going on, but you end up just taking a pretty tough little like running floater from the baseline with not a great angle to like use the backboard or anything. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that this one's more of like a, you know, it's still early in the shot clock, 20 seconds left, and end up taking a tough look here. Would, would, do you think maybe, like, you might have been better served to, like, once you got to this point right here, right, where the screen is happening, this guy helps. That guy's much smaller than you. You think maybe you could have just, like, 
kind of cleared it out and posted him up and then forced a double and like reacted from that? Or like, what, what would you have done differently on this play? So there, there I feel like, like the big man is already helping. So posting yeah. up, like, I feel like I, I would lose the ball because if I post right. up and the Takal's man would come in and help. So it was, I feel like in my mind, when I saw a, a, their point guard just kind of standing there, I, I thought like, okay, like it's go time. So yeah, like, you know, I, I try to use use my muscle, but not use my muscle because they're so good at taking charges these taking days. Taking charges, yeah, yeah for like, sure. Like I, I was trying to use it, but then like you setting second guessing it, like okay, what if I what if I push him yeah. too hard and he falls? That's already a charge on me because it's six ten guy going to, towards little guy. So definitely kind of I feel like I should have just took my time more and yeah. um, just seen the seen the like what's happening. I feel like if I came to a jump stop right there. Right, uh, right here, it will be easier because then I would have Shavar at the top of the key, also, you know. Right, um, because he's rolling and replacing, so you know, right. like, like could was, theoretically have this kick out back available. Yeah, exactly. that's a good point. So I feel like it was more like kind of seeing a little guy and then kind of getting yeah. like, excited, but at the same time not excited because you don't want to catch the card. So it was, dude, it was, it's an it's an epidemic in college yeah. basketball, man. These charge calls are ca- kind of out of control, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, and the. You know, every, everything's so tight. Like, it's just kind of like you can't breathe. <laughs> yeah. Like, charge or, 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 you know what I'm saying? So, it, it was just tough. Yeah, no, I, I feel you on that for sure. Um, and then here, you're kind of breaking down off the bounce against Theo John. And that's, you know, that's just a tough shot, right? The, not, not like too much more to, to put into it other than like you have the handle to kind of break him off the bounce, but he maintains good position and, you know, this is a this is a tough shot right here, right? Like, do, yeah. again, eighteen seconds left on the shot clock. Like, you know, I get it, it's early in the game, but you you also may have even had uh, Miles Kale and your the teammate, right? yeah, 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 Miles Kale cutting right here, and you know, mm-hmm. like we talked about We've earlier, that's one of your, We've done yeah, that. and that's one of your strengths is like seeing those types of things. So, you know, this is like probably a, a nitpicky. Uh, particular instance because you are a great passer but that's you know that was just one clip that stuck out as i was going through through the tape i feel like there it's more like we just started the game so you're just trying to get into the groove right throwing that shot is like maybe kind of (laughs) give you more kind of get oh okay like a tough shot you know we're gonna get into yeah i feel like right here you're just testing it out where you can yeah yeah see what's going and what's not going so i feel like like a shot which like i thought it was i needed to take just to kind of have my check like okay this is what yeah so definitely just a early early shot you know? yeah exactly just getting the adrenaline going getting into the flow and like yeah it's not a high leverage situation at six to five mm-hmm. so like you know, exactly. not too much risk to taking that thing right exactly. um and then here's your example of the charge this one mm-hmm. this one's against a, a bigger fella but and you were looking to do the right <laughs> thing uh and kicking it out for that skip pass so right your, your good vision coming into play uh, but I think it's just one of those, you know, just like you were talking about before, just anticipating that dudes are going to try to bait you into that because you you like to be aggressive and facing up and getting to the rim and stuff, right? Yeah, like 100% right there. You know, he takes a lot of charges for a big guy. <laughs> and yeah. The crazy part is uh, my coach told me, like, if you drive, be careful because he takes charges. But right. I think at this moment, I'm like my head is high and I'm watching Jared. And yeah. I, I thought I was about to make a pass and like kind of go over like euro step or or hop step and then to Jared, yeah. but he, he moved his body perfectly where I couldn't do anything. So gotta take that and just go back play some defense. Yeah, yeah. And hey, I like mistakes like that are are rooted in you being aggressive. So ultimately yeah. you, you kind of live with those, right? As opposed to being passive or you know, making mistakes that are Agreed. are you know geared toward like not actually pushing the issue and like trying to make stuff happen. So, you know, ultimately not the end of the world there for sure. Um, Now we're going to move to defensive strengths. So I think, uh, you know, I think you do a pretty nice job as an off ball defender and, and in the pick and roll when guys get downhill. Um, So, you know, this guy ends up trying to split you here and you just have the, uh, you know, the quick hands. You're able to get, you know, you're 6'11", but you're able to kind of get low and get in there and dig this thing out here. Um, and then obviously, you know, getting out in transition as well. You're super comfortable thereafter. Uh, this one is more so your help side instincts, right? Mm-hmm. So maybe this isn't the best pass from uh, this guy that gives you a little bit more of a chance to pull it off. But I think, you know, there's something to be said for, 
they're running this pick and roll this direction. These two guys are kind of switching places here on this side to kind of, you know, give you something to think about. But you seem to be kind of reading and reacting and anticipating what might happen here and getting to the right spot based on help side principles. So what what are you kind of seeing as this is going down and how do you like kind of end up getting in there and disrupting the play? So first of all, you know, as a senior in college, you already done this probably like 200 times. So right. just, uh, just seeing the screen happen, I already know he would roll. And the, the one thing yeah. I did wrong, I feel like I, if I was one step like in, more in, yeah. you know what I'm saying? It, it would be, it would even be a fast break, but I feel like here, sure. you know, I was I was kind of like got stuck in between because uh, he's a pretty good shooter, so I didn't want to overhelp where they can right. kind of press it to the to the um, opposite corner. So yeah, but it just worked out because it was a bad pass. You know, it, it just worked out where uh, I was on time, and then I had to I, I could throw it out of bounds, so uh, inbound. So um, I feel like just one step in, but um, it was it was a pretty good play where I just read it and I knew they would pass it to. Um, Nate Watson. So, yeah, one. and and you know, like you were saying, you you said you're covering a decent shooter in the corner, mm-hmm. and in the NBA, there's going to be a ton of deadly shooters in the corner yep. in these type of situations. So, like, yeah, ideally, you roll over and and you're able to have a foot on the helpline here and tag the roll man. But you know, sometimes there's going to be a kind of cost benefit analysis to that. If if the guy in the corner is absolute knockdown, like you got to be able to walk that line and balance it, and so. Uh, you know, in retrospect, yeah, maybe a step further in, but I think, you know, it ended up turning out in your favor here and you still were able to make the play. Uh, next clip we've got here. So we got a little post up action going on for, uh, for UConn here. And this is more so you just as an off ball guy, I think reading and reacting to, you know, guys vision, where their heads at, you know, what they're focused on and kind of picking and choosing a spot when like, the guy with the ball is vulnerable and that your guy, you know, isn't even in the equation for what he's thinking about at that moment. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, I guess, you know, as this is all developing, how do you feel comfortable enough to come in here and dig down and get this thing away from the big while knowing that you're leaving a shooter open out here? Well, first of all is uh, of course um, the scouting report. I knew Tyrese Martin is a good shooter, but I feel like, no, he's not like a not like knockdown shooter. So, and and I know, uh, look how far he's from the post. He's at the big east line, so I definitely know. He yeah, just hook shot it from there. He got to take a couple of dribbles, right? And uh, you know, he's not even looking at my side. He's just trying to go. So I feel like at that point, I just waited to, for him to take a couple of dribbles, so he thinks he's comfortable. And Miles already left, so then I come from I come from the back and just just throw the ball. So, um, you know, it was just kind of reading him and just seeing like making him feel comfortable, so then I can take the ball from. Him. Yeah, just re- reading that, you know, good instincts there. And then you spoke to your kind of preparation and knowing the scouting report and knowing, like, yep. hey, I guess if the big guy, you know, firstly, the big guy's not likely to kick this out. And secondly, if he does, like, you know, this isn't a knockdown it, shooter. Yeah, so it, it's not going anywhere. He's not even looking at my, my – like, he's not even looking yeah. at my – I feel like it's just like you already know he's locked in. He wants to go. If you if you get the ball and you put it on the ground, it's, it's over. You know, you want to go. So – I feel like if he stood up, faced up, then it would be different where I have to kind of right. go down a little bit and kind of see the ball in the man. But here he just – he's not looking. He just goes. So it's just easy easy steal from the back. Yeah. So to, uh, you touched on like knowing personnel there and mm-hmm. like being able to anticipate things based on the scouting report and whatnot. Like to what extent have, I guess, over the years you – grown in the capacity of your preparation not just like getting reps and on court stuff in practice but like studying the game and studying film like how has that evolved over the years for you you know freshman year not that serious i, I feel like it was just all about come play leave but yeah the like, more you grow more you understand that the better you know the guy you're guarding the easier it is for you kind of to play defense and uh, i feel like this helped me a lot uh, sophomore year, I played five. Then junior year, I went went to four. So mm-hmm. I feel like I already knew how to ice and red and now switch. So I feel like just I started kind of digging deep into my players, basically watching their highlights maybe before the game so I can see what they're good at. So definitely kind of knowing their go-to moves and, you know, et cetera, just helps you a lot to kind of be a better defender because you know even if you mess up in something where you can't kind of catch up to them where not they're good. Yeah. So, you know, um, it, it, I feel like, 
just for everybody. I feel like the just senior hall does a great job doing scouting, but it's not all about the plays, you know, because yeah. you're playing the game. He can cheat the play and go the other way. So uh, I feel like it just you got to know um, the personnel and tendencies and stuff. Exactly, exactly, and just be all off the health side. If you if you're off and and just kind of controlling your man and the ball, then it just comes naturally to just kind of be be out there. Yeah, no, for sure. And that's often what separates young guys in the league are the ones that take that preparation seriously and aren't just showing up and rolling the ball out there. Yeah. So especially you know, in the league, you know, they got yeah. so many plays you can't really memorize all their plays. Because, right. You know, if you're guarding, let's say JJ Reddick, you know, you gotta be locked in on JJ Reddick because he's such a good shooter. I'm just saying JJ for for, for sure. example or yeah. you know, no, like that's that's the that's the crazy part. Like in NBA, probably they got a deeper meaning of a personnel where you can learn and see, and it's probably like easier because all the guys you are known, so you can really watch them and kind of study. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, and so on this next play here, we're gonna see again you kind of like reading this play and kind of crashing in at the last second and making an impact play defensively. So. You know, there's this little screen action here, and this guy ends up running free off of it for a lob. So, as the weak side guy with a lot of this, uh, a lot of this motion and action going on here, uh, what are you sort of like anticipating? What are you seeing? Uh, I think it's almost like uh, you know, two passes away type reaction that mm -hmm. you're anticipating, right? So, what's going on here for you? What's going through your well, head? Here, I'm reading Jared um, I keep helped of the screen for a shooter. Yeah. So, you know, here you got to read Jared. I can't do much if Jared doesn't rotate because then, yeah. well, you know, it, it, it's just the scramble. So I feel like Jared did an amazing job just kind of stunning at him because I feel like he yeah. read that it was not a great pass and he would not dunk it. So he just stunned at it. And mm -hmm. he, he, he didn't even, even even shoot it. So I was right there to kind of rotate down and, and, and steal the ball. So I feel like it's just kind of like a rope type of thing. He, he goes and he pulls me down. So it's just kind of like we moved it in this type of direction. So definitely Jared kind of helped me out there a lot. Yeah, yeah. He made a great play. And mm -hmm. to your point, just being in sync like that and, right. like, it, you know, having that good chemistry with your teammates to kind of be able to, you know, execute team defensive philosophy and read and react to these type of plays. I mean, sure, it wasn't a great pass to start, but you guys both needed to be in unison on that to kind of prevent, you know, this guy from getting an easy layup out of it nonetheless. And, you know, this one's in a high leverage situation in the game, up by six with 30 seconds left trying to close things out. So, you know, that it's good, good to see, <laughs> Yeah, good to see you stepping up defensively, yeah. like, at, at that yeah. point in time in the game for sure. Definitely. Uh, next clip we have here against Georgetown as well. So uh, we'll see that they get a little bit of a fast break going here. And this is just hi highlighting your, your hustle, right? Like, you mm -hmm. you know, you're willing to kind of get out there, have some, you know, maybe better closing speed than people would anticipate for someone your size yep. to be able to, you know, get up there, get this ball and save it inbounds uh, as well. So, you know, just wanted to highlight that the effort, you. you know, the effort is usually there on defense as well. So, uh, and we see it again here with a little highlight block where uh, they're running a pick and roll and this guy's trying to get downhill and you just kind of, you know, keep coming along with them. You give him a little bit of a bump to throw him off his spot and then send this thing packing out of bounds. So, uh, you know, there's definitely some stuff to be encouraged about on the defensive end. Like you, I think you've made, you know, some incremental improvements on mm -hmm. that side of the ball that I think should be encouraging to NBA evaluators. We see again here this time you're just forcing forcing this guy into a tough shot. You know, you're able to stick with them. And then, you know, a lot of times when these really quick twitch guards get a big switched out on them and then they try, try to like stop on a dime and pull up, you know, a lot of bigs will keep flying down this way toward the baseline and it's an oh. easy mid-ranger for these guys. And you're able to like keep your footing and still impact the shot there. So I think when we get to the improvement area, some of it will be on defending in space, right? But like mm -hmm. you have, you do have it uh, within your capability as highlighted in this particular clip to uh, be able to like impact drivers and still stick with them if they pull up, right? Yeah. So I, I guess as we transition now into the, that improvement area, I guess what have you been working on to try to uh, – get a little bit more comfortable defending in space on quicker guards when you get switched out on pick and rolls and knowing that at the next level, that's probably something that opposing teams will try to do is like get you on an Island against some of these really explosive guards. 
Uh, definitely, you know, we got to work on your hips, on your movement, you know. Um, it's just like all movement stuff, like, yeah, you know, and beating them to the spot. I feel like sometimes you just kind of – like when you get switched out to the guard, like you anticipate they're gonna, what they're going to do, but I feel like you're just kind of staying locked in and just uh, just – being solid is the most important thing with the guards and not going for their pump fake. So um, yeah. I feel like I'm working on my hips a lot, lateral movement, just uh, foot foot quickness. So I feel like just going in the, in, uh, hopefully in the league, I'll just be more consistent in, in guarding the guards and kind of staying down and being faster. So I feel like it's just like work in progress and definitely, definitely coming because I feel like from junior to my senior, it was, it was a better, better yeah. uh, movement so i feel like just keep doing what i'm doing right now working hard i feel like it will just come by itself and uh, i'll be a better defender definitely yeah no, I, I agree and i think we'll see on this one right here like your your intentions are good and in that you're i see you're kind of bouncing on your feet right here mm -hmm. like ready to try to move swiftly and whatnot but like end up just rising a little bit uh and it gives them that slight sliver of like an opportunity to blow past you right um exactly. And then similarly with the organ, uh, it's just like falling for a pump fake and getting too vertical. I think just that's kind of the recurring theme is just trying to stay stay as low as possible to try to like prevent these kind of things from happening, right? And he's a great shooter. So yeah, I, yeah. in my mind, I was like, okay, like he might pull it, he might pull it. So I, I was trying to anticipate the shot. And I feel like that's why I'm saying just staying down and staying low on your base. You know, even if you have to be a second, second jumper, you got to be a second jumper. I feel like here I was just kind of like mm – -hmm like too focused on him shooting, you know? So, uh, yeah. And like, to be fair, he, you know, he's an NBA, he's going to be an NBA player. Right. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, it's a good, it's a good example of like, you know, having to defend in space against a guy with that kind of deep trigger right there. So, you know, you're going to have some guys that can pull it from deep that you might have to defend in space. And I think, you know, especially if you're able to focus on that in your pre-draft training and everything, and like you were saying, working on your hips and your fluidity and your foot yeah. speed, like, that's now's the perfect time to just keep making those incremental improvements with that stuff. And you'll have more time now that you're done with school to like really be able to focus in on that. Like your job is going to be basketball. It's going to be, you know, improving in these areas. So, Definitely. you know, there's definitely a lot of upside for you on the defensive end to like, you know, continue to bring it into form and like become that much, you know, more dynamic of a defensive player. Definitely. Definitely. You know, in, in, the, in, the, in the NBA, the space is even even larger, so yeah. You know, we really have to be a good defender, and and kind of the guards are faster. So you know you got to work on it. I'm working on it every day. You know, going going to my strength conditioning coach. So I feel like it's coming along, and you know I'm pretty yeah. excited on what's laying ahead. So you know I'm just I'm just, I'm gonna just keep working and just prove everybody wrong. Whoever think I can't play defense, I'll just show them I can't play defense. That's all it's yeah. about. Yeah, <laughs> that's the right mentality, man. I like to hear that. Uh, so I'm through all the clips right now. That's all I've got. So, you know, as we wrap this thing up, I'd like to ask uh, two questions here. So the first one, Sandro, is what is your motivation and what drives you to be the best basketball player you can be? Uh, my motivation is I feel like first of all, it's just kind of using my platform to help others and, you know, and mm -hmm. others like just being from a small country and not a lot of people making it out. And now kind of little kids looking up to me, that's the best feeling you can ever have. You know, I was the one kid, yeah. the one kid in the stands at the national team games looking up to Zaza Pachulia. And now he's my mm -hmm. mentor and I spoke to him every day. And I feel like that that's the biggest kind of thing for me. Like I got to be example for the little kids and I got to prove them that if you work hard and do what you have to do, you're going to end up playing pro or getting out of the country and, just kind of, I feel like you just got to keep your head down and, and, and work hard. So definitely one of the motivations is to just kind of be a better example for the youth generation. And also just, uh, you know, my family put so much into it. You can't just kind of say you're not doing this for your family. Of course, I'm doing it for myself, but also I'm doing it for my, my mom who let me go when I was 14 and didn't stay yeah. with me. You know, I only see her once a year. So I feel like all the sacrifices I feel like are paying off and, I just want to be like a, a person who, who didn't waste no time and just got, got it done. Yeah. That's fantastic, man. I love, love to hear that. Love to hear yeah. the motivation to give back and, you know, for others that are in a position that you were earlier in life and, you know, encourage them to make the most of those same opportunities. That's great. And obviously the, 
you know, the family motivation is, is right. fantastic Always. as well. I, are you going to be, are you going to be able to uh, see your mom more frequently now then now that you're, yeah. you know, theoretically so. see her more often? That would be great. That's, that's the goal. You know, um, my mom loves being out here. Uh, she was just here for, for a month, month and a half. And it, like, you know, it's an amazing feeling because you leave, I left as a kid and my mom's relationship with me was kind of more like a mother and a son. But now I feel like every time more I see her, it's more like a friend to friend. So I feel like you see the growth and, and the personality change. And I feel like it's just like me and my mom are bonding so much more right now. So hopefully she can come out here a lot, a lot more often with my father as well and uh, stay here with me for a couple of months. Yeah, that would be fantastic, man. Yeah. Uh, you know, hope, hope that that comes for you. That would be great. Uh, right. You know, I've, I've spent some time with my family this week. So, and I know how, how much that means, especially right. during right. this time when we're not getting to spend as much time with people this past year as we normally would. So right. that's definitely exciting. And then, you know, last question here before we sign off is, I just want to give you the chance to speak directly to NBA teams, to NBA front offices. So who is Sandro Mamu Kelishvili? And if a team was to bring you into their organization, what can they expect from you both on and off the court? If I could tell them something, I would just say, Sandro is a really, really competitive guy who's all about winning, you know, does whatever the team needs to do and sacrifices if he needs to and just kind of keeps his head down and works hard. Uh, I feel like it just all starts, you know, going in the league. You got to be a great listener. You got to be a great example, you know, and you got to be on your best behavior. So, you know, like, you know, playing in the NBA is a, is a dream come true. So, um, you know, definitely I'll be I'll do my best to um, stay motivated, stay hungry, and be as competitive as I, as I can because going in as a 13th, 14th guy, you want to make the stars better, you want to make others better, and you want to yeah. make yourself better. So definitely got to look to that and, you know, just stick to the plan and just go up the ladder step by step. Yeah, that's a mentality that, you know, teams will definitely love and, you know, good good attitude to carry with you as you uh, go and commence your pro career here. So, Sandro, thank you very much for the time, my man. Uh, it was great talking hoops with you. I'm definitely excited to see what's to come for you as you make this journey to the NBA, and I'll be following along through the pre-draft process and into your rookie year and beyond. So uh, I'll be rooting for you, man. Best of luck and appreciate you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. I really appreciate everything. And we're going to stay in touch, you know, um, you know, stay safe, stay healthy and all the best wishes. Absolutely, Sandra. Talk to you later, man.